Hi, everybody. This is Mark Spiegler. We're going to take a second to let everybody come into the room from the waiting room from all over the world. Um, and just, just bear with us for a few minutes, or a few seconds, rather, while, that, while the numbers come up. Um, so let us begin formally. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody joining us from all over the world. A special thank you to those who are in Asia because we know it's quite late on a Sunday. Thanks to all of you for joining us on a Sunday. Many of you joined us yesterday for a fantastic session on the statement sector. Today we're going to go into feature. Um, so in addition to Pratik Raja and Jasmine Sao, who joined us yesterday, we also have Peter Freeman. Um, Peter joined us as a member of the Art Policy Selection Committee in 2017. His gallery is incredibly wide ranging in terms of its program. He has a long history in the art world. Um, he started his gallery 30 years ago after working at the Whitney Museum and then as a director at Bloom Hellman uh, Gallery for a decade. Um, his program is incredibly wide ranging uh, among the artists he represents Sir Thomas Schutte, Mal Bachner, whose work you can see behind him, Lucy Scare and many more. Um, Jasmine was with us yesterday. She founded her gallery in 2012 represent 17 very co contemporary um, artists, 11 of which had their first New York solo shows with her. Um, Pratik joins us from Calcutta. His gallery, Experimenter, which he founded with his wife Priyanka in 2009, is a leading light within the region and functions almost as much as an educational institution as it does as a gallery, holding seminars and curatorial programs. Um, just a quick word uh, about the general, so a little general housekeeping before we start. Um, we will take questions during the presentation and especially at the end. You can, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom. You can put your questions in there. We'll try to get to them as they come in. Um, it's a little bit of a chaotic feature within Zoom, so bear with us. Um, the, for those of you who are joining us from uh, China, we have, mainland, we, have trans, we have translation into Mandarin. Um, I'm going to disappear and let these three great people take you through, um, but I will stick around and perhaps pop around back at the end if there are questions that pertain to me. Um, we have a lot of work today, so I'm going to bid you adieu and pass the baton to this wonderful trio. Take it away, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, to be on this uh, Sunday evening, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon conversation with us on feature. Uh, can we have the uh, slide on the, the main slide, the first slide, please? Yes. Uh, so we're going to speak about feature. Uh, feature is an excellent uh, section within the, within the fair. It's an important section because it allows uh, for very intensely curated exhibitions. It also allows for a lot of uh, beautiful juxtapositions of contemporary and historical work that come together. It also shows um, wonderful uh, contemporary exhibitions along with uh, historical exhibitions. And uh, it really is a place where new discoveries can be made and artists whose careers have been not been so represented over the years can be, uh, can be seen. Um, I want to highlight a, a, a broad sense of what we are going to see today. There are a lot of positions on uh, positions in the sector on women artists, and there are a lot of uh, positions also on, um, um, on exhibitions that talk about the current moment. Uh, and uh, before, uh, before getting into it, I would uh, really encourage you all to reach out and look into the OVRs. And this is just an introduction to the section. And then uh, you it really is open for you for the whole week. And please go ahead and see it. Can we have the, the first slide of the presentation, please? All right. So first up, we have a, uh, a wonderful exhibition uh, proposed by Ben Brown Fine Arts, which is a juxtaposition between two very, very well-known artists, Lucia Fontana and Alighiero Boetti. The, the, the reason that I'm beginning with this, ex, this, this work here is that it's unusual, it's a rare work, a ceramic work by Fontana in 48. Um, and it is a, um, a rare example of this artist's oeuvre. Uh, I will, at this moment, um, just want to say one or two words about this work. Um, this was made in 1948, um, as I said, and it was right after Fontana published his manifesto um, 
Blanco in Buenos Aires regarding the synthesis of space, time, and color, and sound. And this, this work marks a kind of a transition from his figuration to his abstraction, so it's an important work. Um, my colleague, uh, Peter Freeman, who is really an expert on historical material, um, maybe would want to say a few words on this work. It's, there was a fantastic retrospective of Fontana that the Metropolitan Museum did in New York in the last few years. And it made clear what a lot of people forget, which is that Fontana began working in ceramics. That was his uh, beginnings. And ceramics has an extraordinary tradition in Italy, especially in the Renaissance when Luca della Robbia started in Florence in the 1400s, going on till today with Luigi Antani, who makes works that are completely inspired by exactly this early Fontana from the 40s. But this female figure with flowers is quite extraordinary for its scale. And it's showing how the ceramic material, the clay material is almost exploding and disintegrating into represent, from representation to making you realize more what the material it is itself. And it's only after this work that Fontana started to move to painting and the slashes that have become so uh, familiar and radical. Right, and if you go to the next image, uh, which is really an example of that, uh, the two works here, one by Fontana and the other by Boetti, one after the other, which talk about, which also explains this, uh, this presentation beautifully about the juxtaposition of these two artists. Um, this is uh, an early, uh, or a, uh, one of the early Tagli paintings, and um, it talks about a movement, uh, not the usual long slashes that became, became, he became well known for. Um, and yeah, and then there's a Boetti, which, which Peter, if you would like to say something about these two works. In the Boetti's in Ben Brown's presentation, they're all on paper, but of many different series, but like this one very much involved with language. And if you look at the, at the juxtaposition of Fontana and Boetti, Obviously, they're both Italian, Fontana a bit older, Boetti a little bit younger, very conceptual in their work, but really one based on material, Fontana and Boetti much more involved with language, but also giving you a sense of, of the material that goes into making a work of art. This one, the ballpoint pen, the most common thing that we all have in our hand. Next. So, um, from Fontana and Boetti, we come to a contemporary position. So this is another an example of how features use space for contemporary exhibitions as well. This is a uh, this is a group exhibition by Ellen de Brune Projects Amsterdam, where with Pauline Carnia Jardine, Pauline Brody, and Renate Lorenz. Uh, we're going to focus on the work of uh, Pauline Carnia Jardine. Um, Pauline Carnia Jardine was born in 1918, Marseille in France, is an artist, filmmaker, and performer who lives in Amsterdam and Berlin. Now, Pauline was also the winner last year uh, of the Prize National Gallery in Berlin um, and was scheduled to open her exhibition, uh, solo exhibition at the Hamburger Bahn of this year, but that has been uh, postponed for some time, I guess. The image on your screen is an installation view of Hyun Un Sang Impur, um, which is the female installation, or the, the kind of woman installation of um, the, of Jean Genet's uh, Un Chat de Amour, uh, which basically the film has um, underlying tones of sexuality, uh, which inhabits the video all through um, the, the presentation. This is an installation um, uh, which actually the artist spins deflated vinyl fabrics uh, all over the gallery space or the installation space um, in reference to the walls of a red forest. Um, almost um, talks of kind of, if you see the film, in, it's in the OVR, you can see the video, and it kind of juxtaposes this uh, idea of uh, wom women's sexuality in a, in a kind of, um, the, and kind of questions the female body uh, from the point of view of an elderly woman, uh, and questions traditional notions of sexuality and beauty. Um, and I would really encourage you to look at the, uh, the OVR and also explore the, uh, the gallery a bit because uh, Ellen de Brune has been a premier platform uh, for artists working in the video medium as, as well as women artists. Uh, two other artists as I mentioned earlier 
also are working in this, uh, are also showing works in the OVR. So please do take a look at, uh, look at the Elaine de Bruyne project's uh, images. Uh, next up is uh, our, it's my gallery, Experimenter. Uh, we're showing uh, a group exhibition between Bani Abidi, a Pakistani artist, Camp, a collective, and uh, Sora Bhura, a photographer. The work that I'm talking about here is um, a photograph, a series of photographs by Bani Abidi, um, who is uh, one of her most important artists of her generation in, uh, in, from, living between Karachi and Berlin. The photographs really, um, if you go to, go to the next image, uh, the photographs are um, a series of film reels that uh, were found uh, in, a, in a burnt cinema hall in Karachi. And uh, the exhibition tries to capture this moment in time or this kind of changing moments, shifting moments in time. And um, this, this receives a photograph of simple gestural images of these, this, these burnt film reels in a space which is not um, which kind of reminds one of the city that one used to be and kind of losing, mem like the losing memory of the fabric of the city um, that Bani is referring to Karachi, her hometown. Um, this work is uh, placed alongside other works in the exhibition, which uh, are most digital works. That is a, uh, there is a, uh, there is, there are installation walkthroughs of a work by camp, which is a 30 meter installation. The, um, uh, the OVR allows uh, viewers to actually, um, and that's been explored beautifully by galleries. For example, we've installed the installation in our gallery and we've allowed people uh, you to see it through walking through the installation. So please do go and have a look at the installations. And there's also film in the, uh, in the exhibition. So uh, feel free to go and look at it. We can go to the next. Uh, well, image. Pratik, we have a question for you. Can you Sorry. explain more about the burnt film canisters and why they're burnt and what did the films contain? Right, um, so this is um, a cinema hall called Nishat Cinema in Karachi and the, the, films, uh, the films itself didn't contain, um, the, the films that are burnt here didn't contain anything uh, special. There were films that were um, in it, but uh, the reason that the film hall was burnt was um, that there was a, a, a kind of rumor in the city about uh, the burning, uh, all the kind of uh, WhatsApp uh, video of um, uh, of some religious mob who came in and burned the cinema, which led to the uh, the point to kind of think about uh, how memories or a particular kind of uh, architecture or uh, the memory of a city was is destroyed in an instant um, because um, because it's um, because you know in today's time you really don't have the moment to think about history in the sense that it it's all driven by a certain kind of energy or a false sense of immediacy and that's what the artist is trying to uh, see in this body of uh, photographs yeah um, next up is um, is James Fuentes um, showing a group exhibition with Alison Knowles Juanita uh, McNeely and Didier William uh, this image here um, uh, uh, is of uh, a, a beautiful work made in 1967, uh, one of the early printer works. My colleague Jasmine here um, can tell you a lot more about this work and I would give it up to her. Yeah, this is actually um, a question I have even for James, I'd like to clarify. I think that, he, that Alison might have started this project in 1967 um, and she's using actually an algorithm to create a poem. And of course, Alison Knowles is a one of the founders of Fluxus, um, and and sort of the importance in the way of using an algorithm for a couple of reasons. First, it was one of the first computer ever computer generated poems, um, and I'm sort of interested because I find this work very utopic in a way that she's using this technology, which I think you'll find in my generation a more of a dystopic approach to using technology like this. Um, and so there's a four sentence poem and essentially she has a database where for every line of the poem, there's like a database of sentences that the computer can pull from and generate a poem. It later goes on to be something that she uses a lot to incorporate with education. She has students come in and contribute, I believe, to it. Um, but again, yeah, it's just sort of an interesting approach to the Fluxus movement in general where process would have been more important than the Finished product where um, performance is an, a hugely important aspect 
And we'll see again with later presentations of more contemporary artists, the way that they use similar technologies to talk more about kind of social structures, structures of power. But I find this so interesting to see now where I think it's much more about um, the people that were participating in the project um, than any of those larger structures yet. But yeah. Next. Uh, next up is uh, Gallery Christophe Gaillard from France, from Paris. Um, showing a solo by Michel Jurniak. Uh, Michel Jurniak, um, as many of you will know, is one of the founders of body art movement, uh, Art Corporeal. Uh, Jurniak used the body, often his own body, as a fundamental tool um, for his medium and his work. Uh, he's a key figure uh, and emerged as one of the French, key French artists in his generation as early as 1969 for body art. Uh, he used uh, several mediums throughout his career, including painting, photography, sculpture, mail art, contracts, etc. Uh, the works on display at the at the work on display on your screen is, um, uh, uh, as well as in the in the OVR, show Jurniak's use of clothing that serve as an important search for identity um, in the, in, the, in the using of his uh, body for his work, and references how clothes can become an identity to approach. Um, a human and, and kind of interaction. So this is the artist himself in different uh, in different forms of clothes. And these are large um, works. Um, there uh, and and it also has it's called it's uh, has a reflected mirror on the other, on the end as well. Uh, Peter, would you would you want to say something on these works? Well, it was it was an important voice in that moment in the seventies because it was a French voice in a moment when a lot of the people kind of focusing on uh, transformative images of the body into uh, a work of art were often based in places like Vienna, some in New York, um, people using their body like Vito Akanchi, but in a more abstract conceptual way. And I think that um, this work is very reflective of its of its place in France and of the moment where you have an artist really pushing definitions and pushing kind of the boundaries of social expectations and almost through living as a performance making performance as as art right and yeah he had, he had a very complex like, history of work and uh, referred Freudian theory and gender identity constantly uh, can we go to the next image? Um, so this is an, a brilliant presentation by Garth Greenan, a uh, solo on Howard Dina Pindel, uh, a very influential artist. Um, and uh, Jasmine, uh, would you like to say a few words on this? Sure, yeah. Um, Pratik and Jenny and I are all very excited about this presentation of Howard Dina Pindel's. Howard Dina was born in 1943 in Philadelphia and studied painting at Yale at a time when not only would she have been the only woman in the program, but she probably would have been the only woman of color. Um, she's actually, she was, she stated that in her um, monograph. And she starts off as painting and she eventually moves to New York and actually gets a job as a curator at MoMA after applying to many different types of positions. And there she meets Lucy Lepard, who becomes a big supporter of hers. Um, and she eventually becomes one of the co-founders of AIR Gallery, and it's very interesting because um, she would have been somebody that was sort of around um, and a part of the feminist movement before intersectional feminism really um, was understood and, and supported by that community. And so we just uh, were very excited about this presentation in general. And she's somebody that has been overlooked and recently had a retrospective in 2018. And her work is sort of getting a deeper look now. In um, 1970, I think 1978, late 70s, she leaves her job at MoMA and gets a teaching position at Stony Brook. And very tragically, in this drive between um, to Stony Brook, she gets in a car accident and loses her memory. And so her, uh, um, partially. And so approach to sort of reconstructing her own life, she takes photographs and postcards from her travels abroad and um, sort of configures them here. The sort of circular composition is very important in Howard Dina's work. Um, her paintings are much more abstract here, of course, because she's using found photography. It's a bit figurative, but it's still very abstract. Um, she's one of the 
first artist to kind of really step up and say that abstraction can be political, that abstraction can be about my body, can be about, can have content at a time when a lot of people were sort of, um, this is intimidating with Peter Freeman here to be talking about abstraction in the late 60s. <laughs> I don't know how I'm doing, but, I, you know. Abstraction is great. It's what everybody wants to see in it. It's perfect. <laughs> um, but, you know, at a time when it wasn't always um, politicized. So um, her, there's a lot of um, personal content in this work, too. Her mother was a collector of postcards. Of course, there was a time, it's also at a time when mail art and um, was was highly conceptual and used a lot and so um there's this sort of real sentimentality i find in the work but beyond that um i just find her to be a very heroic figure uh, in in this time period and um yeah we're super excited about this work super can we go to the next um next uh, is um hospital gallery from san francisco this is the first time in any basel fair which is welcome welcome to the basel fairs uh, they're showing a, uh, a group exhibition between Liliana Porter, Rina Banerjee, and Patricia Piccinini. Um, and it's dedicated to three women artists. Um, and really, um, what the image that I'm talking, going to talk to you about is a work by Rina Banerjee, which is called Lady of Commerce. Um, Lady of Commerce is, um, is I mean, it has a long title, and Rina Banerjee is, uh, usually uses these long titles to, to talk about the work itself. And there's a large range of materials that Rina uses in her, in her work. Uh, she's born 1963 in Calcutta, uh, where I am right now, uh, but she's lived uh, in the US for many years. Um, and uh, the full, the title of the work uh, includes many different materials that the artist has included. And here you can see uh, materials of high and low art are constantly being included in the work. And she kind of questions hierarchy of art and the work is really called um, The Lady of Commerce. Uh, her infinite and clamorous land and river, ocean and island, earth and sky, all contained, bottled for delivery to an open hole, a commerce so large, her arms stretched wide and sulfurous halo. So it kind of self explains itself. Um, can we go to the next image? Next is uh, Javeri Contemporary, again, um, First time in Basel, uh, they're presenting a uh, group exhibition between three artists, Narani Mukherjee, uh, Simran Gul, and Anwar Jalal Shemza. Here, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Narani Mukherjee. Um, Narani is um, was a sculptor, a very important, influential sculptor. Uh, work. This is a bronze um, bronze sculpture, and the conversation in the presentation between the three artists is about nature and the uh, the abiding role of nature as its, as inspiration. Uh, as a sanctuary as well as a resilient force. Um, Minalini Mukherjee um, was a preeminent sculptor of her time. She uh, cast these in uh, the lost wax method, a very interesting but a very tedious method of uh, producing works. They're, 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 they're kind of monumental figures. They're almost two meters or two and a half meters in height. Uh, and they feel as if they're kind of organic uh, forms, but they're, they're also not definitely defining a particular uh, uh, plant species, but almost like talking about form itself. Um, if we go to the next image. Um, so a wonderful exhibition uh, presented by a castman between Lee Krasner, Max Ernst, and uh, Ali Bansa, who was a younger artist, but I would um, really ask uh, Peter to talk about these wonderful works by Lee Krasner. The, um... This Krasner is a charcoal drawing from the 30s. And it's, if we can say we're all experiencing Basel online virtually, and many things would be the same and many things are fundamentally different in the experience, but different in real too. My memory is that it was these drawings from the 30s plus amazing large painting by Krasner in the 70s where she took these drawings, cut them up and made these collage paintings that were really stunning late works of a great artist. And the stand that we were expecting to see in real life would be that collage painting with a group of these drawings from the 30s that had been saved and hadn't been cut up. So it's nice that we can see virtually online uh, the foundation of that proposal, and this is one of those drawings, very much out of Picasso, 
very much an American looking to radical European art and trying to kind of process it. In a funny way, Krasner suffered for being Pollock's wife. And I think as time has passed, she's been accepted more and more into her own for her own accomplishments, which are wonderful. And I would have liked to have seen these drawings that were trying to process another way of working that wasn't quite her own into having one of the paintings from the 70s where she completely processed it and in destroying these works made something quite fantastic. Super, can we go to the next image? This is uh, the other part of the Kasman uh, presentation online is a group of urns and this is probably the best one. It's the earliest, it's 1931 and it's very much uh, presenting a classic Ernst where you have collage in reality, collage in imagery and that seed of surrealism which is becoming very formal and, and very, um, really very strong in creating a recognizable image that is another world that doesn't quite exist. It's a wonderful small painting. Yeah. Um, Levy Gallery is a gallery that we will speak about. They're presenting a, a, a two-person exhibition between Daniel Boeri and Merit Oppenheim, really a, a celebration of the friendship and the relationship between these two artists. Uh, they, uh, Peter, would you like to say a few words on this as well? Yeah, Levy included a text at the beginning of their room, which I'm hoping that people that are watching will actually read, but it reminds us that um, Spuri was a ballet dancer when he met Merit Oppenheim, and she was the one that really encouraged him to focus on making art. And the art that he made was very conceptually driven. He was a founder of Fluxus. We've already seen Alison Knowles, and I think there's another Fluxus artist coming up in the presentations later. And this is a typical work where he would invite people to uh, have a meal. And in this case, this was uh, a meal that took place in Dusseldorf where he was living. He was Swiss and Merit Oppenheim was Swiss and for a show at Bruno Bischofberger, which was a great Swiss gallery in Zurich in 1972, he would stop the meal at a certain point and glue everything down on the board to preserve it. And that became the work of art, which was a wonderful kind of transformation, even from the horizontal uh, surface of the table to being hung on the wall. All right, next. Um, next is a David Lewis Gallery from New York presenting a group exhibition between Mary Beth Edelson, Lucy Dodd, and Todd Gray. Um, Mary Beth Edelson is uh, what we're showing, we're going to talk about on the, on the OB, on the discussion today. And uh, she was a very important historical artist and, um, and, and two bodies of work are being represented here. Uh, Jasmine, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, these works? Sure, so Mary Beth Edelson was born in 1933. So she was just a little bit, um, she was around in New York a little bit earlier than Howard Dina, but they probably would have been um, overlapped in some circles in some capacity. They both were supported um, by Lucy Lepard. Um, Mary Beth's work was a bit more, um, she, I think in some ways she wasn't fully accepted by the feminist community because she was really interested in re-engaging in women's spirituality. And in these works in particular, she was using her own body and which of course was important in um, in the time period of where they were looking at performance and things like this. Um, remind me that I think the years in the 70s, mid 70s for this work. Um, but she's also pointing to, the, yeah, so not only her body as a site for performance and engaging in the viewer in that way, but she's also pointing to um, ritual and spirituality, which is something that we kind of, um, in yesterday's talk, talked about how a lot of younger artists are pointing towards these references. And I think that it's an interesting, um, it's interesting how in different time or in different cycles, some of these references, you can approach them with more sincerity than others or, and I think that Mary Beth Edelson was quite sincere in her approach, but just that when you don't, when you do or don't have baggage about the patriarchal structure that some of religion sort of carries with you. Um, so there was a lot of feminists that didn't always get on board with Mary Beth's work, I think. And so we were excited about this presentation to kind of relook at um, her, her work and yeah. Yeah. Um, this uh, next is uh, Lovenbrook, which is presenting us um, a solo by Jean Dupuis. And as Peter was mentioning, there is a, there's a 
kind of essence of fluxus in this work as well. This is uh, an early sculpture. It's a cone pyramid from 1968 uh, and kind of the first work of Dupuy's Daisy Art series. Um, the piece functions through a stethoscope um, and you basically place the spectators, place the stethoscope to his heart and uh, there's an amplifier of the, the vibrations that the heartbeat causes. And there's a red pigment powder inside this um, sculpture, which, uh, which then uh, is through the membrane. Um, it kind of explodes and falls depending on this beat of your heart and that creates the sculpture. Peter, would you like to tell, tell us a little bit about um, this work and uh, John Dupuy as well? Well, it's, um, again, it's a French gallery and a French artist and it's, uh, in the 70s, many people around the world were exploring different kinds of questions. And this was typical where you had an artist wanting to make art as if he wasn't touching it, whether having a machine making it or others. Um, as uh, Patik said, he, what he called lazy art. And he ended up making things that were very kind of geometrically present, very, very technologically present. And you have to remember in the 70s, all technology was new. And something like this would have felt unfamiliar and radical. It feels familiar to us now because artists like this made this foundation that have led us here. And it's a nice early example of using technology. All right. Next image. Ah, so another uh, juxtaposition of two very well-known artists. This is uh, Galleria Lorca and O'Neill from Rome uh, presenting uh, Richard Long and Giorgio Grifa uh, in an exhibition that they title uh, Horizontal Vertical, where uh, the, the Grifa works are all horizontal in a way, and the works that uh, are presented by Richard Long are mostly vertical. Um, uh, Peter, this is really your... Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's a nice thing and I hope uh, they're both wonderful artists and looking at this horizontal and vertical is a way of saying that Long works on the ground, taking natural materials like stones and rocks and making shapes out of them like a long line or a circle. And uh, Griffa is an Italian artist about 10 years older. He's from Torino and he's about 84 years old, uh, long, I think is in his mid seventies. And uh, Griff is making paintings where you're also feeling the material. And that's really what links these two artists, the sense of canvas, the sense of paper, the sense of paint as paint. Um, but for all the people watching this and experiencing a virtual fair, one must always remember that so much of our experience of art can be very positively filtered through the galleries that are representing these artists and dedicating themselves to these artists. And in this case, the reason really why you have a British sculptor and an Italian painter together is because Lorcan O'Neill is a wonderful Irishman who lives in Rome. And so this is very much a reflection of the dealer's interest in uh, the artist that he's representing and also the place where he is. And it's a, it's a nice combination for that as well. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, Gallery Max Meyer uh, is presenting a solo by Irina Haiduk. This is another contemporary uh, position that we're going to de delve into slightly. Um, the Haiduk's work takes a closer look at today's network society and she presents a kind of complex project under the title Yugo Export. Uh, Yugo Export works as a self-managed unofficial organization uh, that kind of commenting on the structures or mechanisms of former Yugoslavia. Um, what, uh, what Irena and Gallery Max Maya have done is that they've actually made a website called yugoexport.com and we encourage you to go and click on the website and experience the artwork. They've used the digital uh, OVR to really make a wonderful digital exhibition. We would have loved to see this, this kind of store uh, front front format that they had uh, really uh, uh, really thought about in the presentation earlier, but this virtual presentation is really, really interesting. Um, so please go and see this one uh, in the thing. Uh, now we come next to uh, a gallery from uh, Madrid, Juan Mira Madrid. Um, this is uh, a solo by an important artist, Juan Downey, 
Uh, Hugh and Downey uh, lived between New York and Chile, but spent a significant amount of time with the Yanomami tribe in uh, the deep Amazon forests of Venezuela. Uh, he developed some of his most important early video works there in 1976 and 77. A couple of those documentation works are available to be seen in the OVR. I would encourage you to, for you to see it. They're incredible footages of the, in, in, the, in the Venezuelan forests. Um, Downey's practice was deeply inward looking and one that focused on exploring the shared cultural roots of America and his drawings showed the man, meditative uh, nature of his thinking. Uh, the drawings um, focus on light and the shapes that are at times spiral, concentric as is the image, um, and often luminous in, uh, in nature. All the works shown in the OVR are works on paper and from the period of 77 uh, and 76 and are historical and influential. Uh, but this artist is less known in the continent and that's what makes this uh, section, the fe features make a very exciting place to be so you can discover new artists. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, now this is another wonderful gallery. Um, uh, again, first time in Basel. Um, this is Parker from Los Angeles presenting a solo exhibition by this brilliant artist, Franklin Williams. Um, uh, Franklin Williams is uh, an underrepresented Bay Area figure who defies the parameters of funk, not visionary and pattern decoration movements. One of the true importance of section like feature is to highlight and uphold the works of underrepresented art. And this is a fine example of that objective. Uh, works presented here are of a specific period between 1965 and 75 and highlights a rich um, period of material and conceptual experimentation by the artist. Uh, foregoing the dominant trends of abstraction, abstract expressionism and figuration, which is espoused by the modern Californian artist, Williams developed a deeply personal and idiosyncratic way of making art that kind of defines his broader, broader practice. He was influenced at a very early age by his mother, um, by household craft traditions, developing an inventive approach to making everyday objects encouraged by his family to pursue his creative um, impulses. Uh, he was also inspired by his mother's very elaborate decorative uh, quilts. These sculptures range from various sizes. They're small, they're sometimes they're very, very small. They help, you can hold them in your hands to a little larger, you can put them on a pedestal. Um, the the skill, he skillfully applied sewing, crocheting to his earliest objects. If you zoom into the OVR, uh, the OVR really has beautiful features of zooming into the images. You can see how much, um, how much more um, detailed and uh, kind of um, tactile these materials are. Can we go to the next? Yeah, well, before we do, we just wanted to say that, that um, Parker built an outdoor exhibition of uh, right. this whole booth. And so you can, in LA, of course, they have the liberty of doing these sorts of outdoor exhibitions. And it's really beautiful. And if you are in LA, you can go and check it out in person. Yes, please do. And I saw some images online. It was be beautifully made, that booth. Um, next up is um, Project Native Informant uh, with a solo by this. Um, and um, Jasmine, do you want to say something about this project? Sure, sure. This is a New York-based collective of Lauren Boyle, Solomon Chase, Marco Rose, and David Toro. And Project Native Informant did a very special thing where they made um, a sort of online presentation to better show uh, this proposal. This is celebrating their 10-year anniversary, and so they actually have work from 2011 up until uh, 2020 on there. And this is a really incredible uh, collective. I've sort of referenced them a little bit in our talk yesterday when I was talking about Dina Iago. Dina Iago is much younger, but I think that, or a bit younger, but I think that what they both do is that they're both embedded in new capitalist structures and critiquing them. So capitalism becomes this very important um, sort of monster to kind of understand in order to understand, you know, almost all of our sort of struggles that we're going through today. So they, have an online subscriber-based um, website called disart, dis.art, where you can go and see their sort of um, uh, edutainment type of videos where they really go into uh, a lot of the ones that I'm very interested in are the ones that sort of center in around the 2008 financial crisis. And there's something about the way that they um, construct these videos that are not quite documentaries, um, and they're not quite, they're not in any way satirical. They're very sincere in terms of the actual script, 
And the vis but the visuals that they provide are so um, just that, like entertaining in terms of their casting, their costumes, the editing. So they're kind of also critiquing this form of documentary um, that was very popular now through um, just, yeah, through streaming services. But they're a very, I highly suggest you check out um, Project Native Informants online presentation because it's absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you, thank you, Jasmine. Next is Barbara Tum with a beautiful presentation by Joe Bea. Uh, Peter, you, can you help us with this? Yeah, absolutely. This is a really special and strong uh, feature presentation. Joe Bear was a rare abstract painter from the 60s uh, in a moment in, in a style that was really dominated by male artists. And she was celebrated then for doing quite beautiful abstract works that already kind of tested uh, the materiality, the physicality of a painting where the image would bend around the, the side of the painting. They're great works, they remain great works. And then she kind of pulled herself out of the art world. She stepped away from that success and she stepped away from that style that was very complete and, and hermetic. These works fall into really a couple different groups that are all based on a very mysterious narrative, personal imagery, works that almost feel unfinished. None of them are dealing with abstraction. None of them are dealing with uh, the complete work of art that she was kind of famous for, but she made another very satisfying, very um, compelling body of work that she's been involved with ever since that are dealing with kind of personal histories. And they're wonderful works that are worth exploring. Yeah, and do go to the website as well and see the, uh see the, the videos that they made um, uh, for the works. And um, next is um, Upstream Gallery with uh, Jody. Um, they're really uh, one of the pioneers, the preeminent pioneers of net art. And um, they're also showing two other artists, Tabor Roback and Rafael Rosendahl, which is the entire presentation is a digital presentation. Um, it's, it's a very interesting mix of works. Um, and uh, Jody really uses internet and technology very beautifully. Uh, Jasmine, would you want to say something about this work? Sure, I think we might have a work up titled Wi-Fi at the bench that might be different than the work that I admittedly prepared for. So I'm just gonna talk about the one that I prepared for in the event that I think it might be different from this one. Um, but just to take a step back, Jody is an artist duo, Joan um, Heimskirk and Dirk Peismans. They were very influential to artists in my program. So I'm, I, I'm very, um, I admire them quite a lot. They were among the first artists to really use the web, um, the internet browser as a, as an art tool, an art device. And I think this is kind of where we see full circle of where we started with Alison Knowles, who was using algorithms to kind of point to an opening, the idea of what art could be. I think that was sort of in part, one of the primary concerns of Flexus, but now we're seeing with Jody, a little bit more of how can these devices, I think, point to their structures themselves. And with a little bit of like, not necessarily a political position, but one where you can kind of go in and see how these technologies work. And so there's another piece that they were showing, I'm not sure if it's still up, but it's called Wi-Fi, where, um, which I think is different from this one, Wi-Fi from the bench, but with just Wi-Fi, you could go to an exhibition space and there would be Wi-Fi network, an, a, a Wi-Fi network that you could connect to. And once you connect, you could see all the other phones that were connected to the same network and where they were within the exhibition space. Now, of course, an exhibition space might be somewhat small compared to the sort of larger network that they're referencing here, which is sort of the geolocation. They're using the same technology that Google uses for their geo um, location technology. And as you might know, Google uses this to find out, to help their users know like when restaurants are gonna be the most popular and when um, you, know, you can go there for the least amount of wait times. So in exchange for not having to wait at a restaurant, we give away, of course, all of our privacy. And Jody points to this without necessarily making a political statement, but of course it's impossible not to have a political, or to come away with a more of a political awareness. Um, but that's just, you know, one, part of their practice. 
some of it is much, you know, there's a really wide variety. So I highly suggest you check out um, and contact upstream, find out more about their larger practice. Right. A wonderful presentation next up is by the Dovey Gallery between Rene Magritte, Pablo Picasso, and Jean, Jean Dubuffet, none of whom need particular introduction, but um, this exhibition really is about surrealism, cap cubism, and art brute. And Peter, please tell us a little bit about this. Um, Vidovi is a gallery from Belgium, and one of their specialties, no surprise, is in the work of René Magritte, who was Belgian and one of the inventors and greatest practitioners of, of surrealism. This is a wonderful gouache. Magritte was, uh, in his practice, very well known for making very complete, fully rendered small gouaches that would often be based on paintings or kind of as equally engaging as painting. So this is an, an important, full, completely rendered work that is quite typical where there's a very clear image that somehow is a reality that can't possibly be a reality. And it's kind of wonderful that the leaf turns into the tree and the tree is referencing the leaf. Um, it's a very typical, strong work. The, Picasso's, if you look at the rest of the website, are mostly of a certain kind that are quite intimate in the artist looking at his model, often lustfully. And the Dubuffets, which are wonderful, are completely different entirely, where there's a sense of, of making a figure or defining a figure where you're, you're crystallizing it out of fragments of the artist's mark. The three artists couldn't be more different the groups of work couldn't be more different and it's kind of a, a pleasure just to see works of, of that quality. Yeah, it's really an example of the galleries putting the food together. Next up is uh, Venus of Manhattan um, with a solo exhibition by Peter Saul. Uh, Peter Saul uh, is an important artist um, and the works presented here are his manual works on board in the 1960s that address a list of provocative and evocative issues facing America in the 1960s, war, racism, sexism, police brutality, political violence, all topics more relevant today than they were probably 50 years ago. Peter, will you let, tell us a little bit about these works and Peter Saul's importance? Um, Peter Saul's still alive, he's about 85 years old and has very recently had a fantastic retrospective at the New Museum. He's been a figure always around, um, very much kind of an artist, artist, where he's maybe not as wide a popular presence as he should have, but I think that's changing now. Sometimes people refer to these work as pop. They're much more cartoon based in a way. They're much more politically based. They're poking fun. They're making a comment with absolutely no subtlety whatsoever. And in the kind of outrageousness of them, there's a real pleasure. There's always a very recognizable style. There's always an energy. And there's been a consistency since these works from the 60s right on to today, where you get an artist working for a lifetime in a, in a vein, constantly developing these ideas. And there's a, a real pleasure for that dedication. This is a typical work from the 60s. Wonderful. We go to the next slide. Uh, so this is um, an amazing gallery presenting work from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Walden Gallery uh, is a solo by Ulysses Carrion. Um, Walden, um, Ulysses Carrion is well known for his uh, decisive role in defining conceptual uh, artistic genres and artist books uh, through his manifest of new art of making books, 1975. He founded a very important bookshop in Amsterdam which is, uh, was called Other Books and So, which was entirely dedicated to artist publications and experimentation, uh, navigating between con conceptualism, concrete poetry, artist writing, performance and lectures. This is a, a film uh, that the gallery is proposing, uh, to show, has proposed to show. Uh, the film is called Death of the Art Dealer, which is an interesting name. Uh, it was first conceived as a performance and a carry on, you made use of the 19, 1949 film by Max Ophelis um, and holding a small video monitor on which the film was playing, the artist physically follows the original camera movements in the film, uh, from left to right, back to front, up and down, 
so as to comment on this, the films, the film on the on uh, on the screen as well as cinema's construction. The video challenges the limits of language and systems of communication, and using TV as camera as canon ironically reverses the roles of narrative. It's a very interesting uh, work. Uh, do see it on the OVR, um, and it's it's it's, it's a fun work. Um, next, uh, next we have. Um, a really amazing exhibition by three women artists. Um, I think women artists, uh, Mikaline Thomas, Zanel Moholi, and Seng Pyong Chi. Um, the work that um, is on your screen is a beautiful photograph uh, by Mikaline Thomas. Um, Jasmine, would you like to tell us a little bit about this artist? Sure. The work? First, I want to highly suggest you. Um, Basel actually made a video with Mikaline interviewing her and in this actual, um, you know, in, in, in the galleries of VR, you can view it. And so what I'm getting ready to say is essentially quoted from Mickalene's uh, video. It's much better when it comes from her, but Mickalene Thomas's photographs, paintings, and videos question perceived notions of race, gender, and sexuality, specifically black women in media and how concepts of beauty come through or are portrayed through commercial photography. And so she cites Jet Magazine as a huge influence to her work, which is of course an important American um, magazine that chronicled the civil rights movement and the murder of Emmett Till, the Montgomery bus boycott and activities of civil rights. Um, they also were a fashion health magazine. So there was a lot of portrayal of black women in this magazine and McLean cites it as a huge influence into um, the, the sort of posturing of, of those black women and how they felt comfortable in front of that camera. And I think that coming forward to her work and her photography, it's very important that there is this um, sort of understanding that the black woman's image is in the hands of another black woman. And I think that that's um, how you can, what you can kind of see in the posturing of their of her figures. Here she's referencing the Virginia Woolf um, novel Orlando, where the figure, the center, central protagonist goes, is like a sort of um, uh, a eternal figure. She lives through all these different generations. And in all these different generations, she uh, changes sex and adapts to different back and forth. Um, and what I sort of find so interesting about that idea of kind of being this sort of like um, this like butch lesbian vampire is that you can sort of come in and out of these different generations and different societal structures and be visible and invisible or or just this kind of fantasy of, ha of one figure having multiple lovers. And so here we have this kind of pr um, sort of proud um, figure that I think um, yeah, is like sort of aware of her presence in a very interesting way. Yeah. Super. We now come to our last uh, gallery that we will speak about. Uh, gallery is Lotowski, um, presenting a wonderful solo by Stefan Mondelbaum. Um, it's a crucial rediscovery of an artist. Uh, born in 1961, Mandelbaum was had a very short life and a a very prolific career in a short life, was tragically murdered at the age of 25, leaving behind a body of provocative work that can be described as a crossover between neo-expressionism and outsider art. He's remained in the shadows for 30 years, so it's really an amazing uh, presentation here. Um, he unfortunately got himself involved in, uh, in the underworld in Paris and prostitution as well, and uh, murdered was murdered for a, for, uh, for a stolen painting that he himself got himself involved in. Uh, it's very important now to uh, kind of focus on a little bit on Mandelbaum's uh, life itself. He was dyslexic from childhood and drawing became a primary method of expression for him. Uh, in his search for identity, he made many self-portraits, many of which are in the OVR, beautiful works, in a way of expressing himself, even as a compulsive, even as a compulsive representation of his persona. The text uh, that you see over here, so often written in English, French, also Latin, um, which, is, which is interesting. Uh, this includes a strong body of works, the OVR includes a strong body of works and large drawings that offer an opportunity for you to um, enter the magical world of Mandelbaum. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if Peter, you want to speak about this artist and his work and be happy to hear. No, I think, I think they're quite strong. They're obviously quite diaristic. They're large in scale, so you can't really ignore them, even though they're drawings that ordinarily would be quite private and quite intimate, but they're intense and disturbing that kind of seem to be coming from inside 
the, a screaming head in a way. Um, it's a real voice. It's a strong voice. And it's wonderful to be in front of works where you're, in a sense, um, in front of nightmares that have become alive, but in a way that you don't want to turn away from, but somehow you want to keep looking at them, even when they're from usually images of some such transgressive and unpleasant figures, like Nazi figures, prostitutes, criminals. Um, he was dealing with a lot, but he put it on paper in a way that um, is very, very strongly engaging. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to the end of our walkthrough for feature. I hope you enjoyed it. There's lots more to explore and see and discover in the OVR, especially in, I hope over the next week, while this treasure of the OVR is still on, you will explore and enjoy browsing through these works. Welcome back, Mark. Thank you. I just want to say that was, that was really fascinating. Um, we didn't have a lot of questions. Um, somebody asked if, they can, if this will be recorded. Of course it will be. You can find it on our Facebook channels. You can find it on the YouTube channels. Um, um, there was a question specifically about Fluxus. Um, and the use, uh, people asked about, about Fluxus and the, and the legacy of people using Fluxus in, in photography to a document, uh, using photography to document performance. Um, and, and it's a very broad question. I'm not sure how much it applies to, to the works that were here, but I mean, does anybody want to take a stab at it since we have a couple of minutes left? Peter, as the elder statesman? <laughs> It's, it's hard to know. I'm not even sure I can remember the precise definition of flexus, but it was uh, very much an activity, very much based on language, very much based on using objects that were non-art common objects at hand to make uh, some new object that would make you uh, rethink something, again, usually language-based. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what we know from Fluxus beyond the physical objects that are left are photographs documenting the important performances that were Fluxus performances. And so I think a lot of our sense of that history comes from that documentation. And that's always important. It's important for performances that are made now by younger artists pursuing entirely different threads. Yeah. Okay. Um... A little piece of art history. Uh, again, thank you very much to the panel. That was fantastic. I think it's, it, was, it was amazing how quickly and yet how thoroughly you went through 24 different uh, presentations. But I think, you know, in essence, um, we have to view this not as the work that a gallerist would do if you were standing in their booth, but rather as a preview, you know, a sort of teaser or trailer, if you would, um, you know, by, by three of the nine people who were heavily involved in choosing these, these um, the, you know, in choosing these, uh, these artists and these galleries. Um, again, I think you can only really get the depth by going into the booths, so to speak, and then contacting the gallerists if you want to know more. Um, thank you very much to the three of you. And um, again, thank you everyone who came. Um, I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. It's amazing how even having sat through the selections procedures, even having you know known a lot about many of these artists beforehand, um, I always learn something. And so I hope that those of you who found this interesting will forward it on to your friends as well and tell them how great it was. Um, Pratik, Jasmine, Peter, thank you very much. And to the team behind all of this, you know, off, off camera, so to speak, thank you very much. And most of all, thank you to the audience for showing up and, and you know, sitting through it with us. I, I, again, it was great. So. Thank Everybody, you. Uh, again, good afternoon, uh, good morning to those of you right at the end of the morning in, in, in the United States, and uh, to those of you who are coming up on midnight um, in, in Asia, you know, we wish you a good week that's about to start. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes.